don't have to have been born seeing spirits. I wasn't. I had no idea there was a greater reality until my stepdaughter passed and I went looking for her. I found her and so much more. And once I did, I needed to know how that's possible and how it worked. Hello, Susan. How are you? And welcome back. Oh, Yannicka, it's so awesome to be back with you. You're, the interview we did in 2017 was one of my favorites to this day. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. And I got so much great feedback from it as well. And in that interview, we talked about your transition from being a Navy commander to doing what you're doing today, being an evidence-based uh, medium. And that's quite a leap. And for everybody who are interested in learning about this story, I highly recommend checking out our interview. And I put a link below. And I wanted to interview again, uh, Susan, because I have been following some of your programs at the Shift Network, and I'd love for you to share about that as well. I know you have an upcoming course now. And then I know that you also had a dear friend of yours that passed away in 2018, and that sort of changed your work. I'd love to hear about that. Yes, you said that it, it's caused my work to evolve, but this is the beauty of mediumship and the spiritual path, that it's constantly changing. And I tell anybody who takes my classes that you should buckle your seatbelts because once you're committed to this path, it really does just keep getting better. There's no limit to how clear that connection can get. But nothing surprised me so much as when my dear friend, Brenda Baker, I met her through this work. She was a student of mine passed to the other side in 2018. And she had been studying mediumship and she said, if at all possible, she was going to reach out to her fellow friends and to me, but I never expected her to drop in on me within hours of passing. I was sitting in my bus that we travel around the country in, and all of a sudden she was right there on the couch beside me, talking in her voice, her mannerisms, joking with me. I looked at my husband and I said, oh my God, Brenda is here. And I picked up my iPad and started typing word for word what she was saying about how easy her crossing was, about how she was visiting everybody all at the same time that she felt so free of her body, which had been filled with cancer. And I said to her silently, Brenda, this is all wonderful. I know it's you. I can tell it's you. I've never been more sure of a connection in my life. But if I share this with people, they're going to question it because there's no evidence in what you're sharing with me. And you mentioned, Yannicka, that I'm evidence-based. She had to tell me something I could validate. We can't validate that it's wonderful across the veil. We can't validate that her crossing was easy. So I just sent her that silent message. Where's the evidence? And without pausing, she said a statement that really made me cock my head and say, what's she talking about? She said, like my boa? And she flipped her hand back like this. Now, a boa is one of those crazy feathery neck pieces that people wear, right? And I had no idea what she was talking about, but I knew it would be the evidence I needed to validate her visit. And I knew that our mutual friend would know what she was talking about. So she continued chatting with me. And when she left, she said, I'll be back tomorrow, <laughs> which just cracks me up. I validated the BOA thing. Now I'm talking on and on. Is this, is this okay? Oh yeah, yeah, I, I'm listening, okay. I'm in. okay. So I sent the whole transcript of what she said to our mutual friend, Lynette, and I said, what's up with the boa? She replied back, oh my God, nobody knows this story that she and I used to talk about that validates the afterlife. It turns out that Lynette kept telling Brenda this story that when we cross the veil, these bodies are just what what Lynette and Brenda called people suits, and that we shed them when we crossed the veil. And Lynette said that it reminded her of a time when she was young and went to New York City, very excited because she was going to see Zsa Zsa Gabor, her favorite. And she walked past Broadway of a stage 
And there was a poster of Zsa Zsa Gabor looking very ordinary in her role for that play, dressed like a farm girl. And Lynette was heartbroken. And then from the side stage door out stepped Zsa Zsa Gabor in all of her magnificence. And as Lynette tells the story, boa and awe, wearing a boa. And Lynette tells me that right up until the day Brenda died, Brenda would say, Lynette, tell me the Zsa Zsa story. Because it always ended with Lynette saying, I know that all of us are like Zsa Zsa. We can dress like a farm girl or a mailman or a fireman or whatever. But when we cross the veil and take off these people suits, we step back into our magnificence, boa and awe. Now, I never heard that story. My friend who has just died hours earlier comes through clear as day to tell me how amazing her crossing was, how she's doing wonderfully. And I ask her for evidence. Could there be anything more evidential than like my boa? It's the whole answer to the question. I'm here, I took off the people suit. I have completely stepped back into the magnificence of the soul. So it's one of my favorite stories. It was a little lengthy, but I, if you'd like, as we go along, I can tell you how Brenda is now helping me daily from across the veil. I love that story. And yeah. I, I really agree with you how important it is with these evidences, because I know there's so many people there asking for signs and then they do get some signs and then they they doubt it afterwards. Was it really a sign? And they sort of feel stupid. And I've felt that too. Like, oh, maybe that was my grandfather after all. So how are you really seeing and perceiving? Like you're saying, you're chatting with her. What does that mean? In my sense of chatting, I know when I'm chatting. <laughs> yes. But yeah. Is it, uh, do you see them, feel them, sense them? Or how so this, is, this has been the frustrating thing for me that I do not see them but it has caused me to really hone my sensitivity to hearing them, feeling them, and seeing little images that they send. So I have all of the clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience, but not their faces. I can't describe them, but the details that I can describe are pretty astounding. Every time I go to do a reading now, Brenda drops in. She's helping me with my readings and we play a game. Every time before a reading, I say, Brenda, you hear? Tell me what Lynette is doing now or give me a very current event. And boom, just like that, she'll tell me something. I quickly text Lynette and it's valid every time. Bizarre things like last week, she went like this. I, could see, I can't see her face, but I could see she was touching a front tooth and I texted Lynette and I said, Brenda tells me you're having a problem with your front tooth. She said, I have my dentist appointment at three o'clock today. It's super sensitive. That's what I'm talking about. I just got a, a thought that even though you're, you're not seeing, like you're saying, it seems like you have an expanded awareness. So you're sort of sensing that you're seeing it nevertheless, if that makes sense. Because I'm thinking that on the other side, we have other senses. It's not just seeing and hearing. It's sort of That's an right. expanded way of, of feeling and sensing. And it seems like for you, you just tap into a, another way of sensing. That's it's right. I, I call it seeing with the eyes of the soul. Right. Yeah. So let's jump into the basics. From your perspective, what happens when we die? It depends upon your condition before you pass. If you have no belief in the afterlife and you're suddenly in an accident, you were not expecting to die, there could be a, a bit of confusion what's going on here as you're suddenly aware of a whole new reality, like being dropped into a very vivid dream, only this is more real than anything you ever knew in your current life. There are thousands of near-death experiences that validate this, but those across the veil have told me this in thousands of readings as well. Then there are those like Brenda who knew they were going to pass, who was fully aware there is an afterlife. And she said, I just blinked. So 
no loss of consciousness that she was aware of, except she was unconscious to us before she passed, as many are in their final days. And she was immediately looking in on all of us. Uh, those with dementia are often quite alert and aware of what's going on when they cross because their soul has already been playing across the veil while the human side is not very sentient. So it's going to change with everybody, but almost everybody is greeted by someone, by a loved one, and finds they're so much more free when they cross. So what you're saying is that it, it's actually very individual, uh, that because I'm curious about that, if it's really tailor, tailored to each individual soul, what happens after you die? And also, if your belief system is really coloring what's going to happen right after. Yes, my mother, even though she watched me unfold as a medium for over for about 12 years before she passed, really could not wrap her head around the concept of an afterlife. And so she didn't really think there was going to be anything else. She really didn't believe my father would meet her and I knew he would. And I had the amazing experience of going to visit her across the veil after she passed. It happened in meditation, but it was so real. And I found myself standing at her bedside almost as if she were still back in the hospice. But this was a beautiful healing place where she was. And I saw her and the guides told me she thinks she's dreaming. We're going to give her some time to adjust to this. Oh, that makes sense. Okay, yeah. could we sort of influence this already, uh, so, sort of prepare ourselves uh, for this moment and to have a nice transition? Oh, yes, you're doing it right now by, by looking into the afterlife. Anybody who's watching is already priming themselves integrating your human awareness with what the soul already knows get ready good things are coming hmm. uh, do you think we have a certain uh death date is that predestined or is that sort of malleable we can change it so funny you ask that that way a certain date many people say a certain time when we're going to pass and i would say yes but as for a certain date I'm asking my guides right now. It's not always exact for everyone, but the reason it's interesting you ask, Yannicka, is because just this morning someone shared with me how years ago she was told that somebody in her family would pass on this certain date, and they did, of leukemia, and they didn't even have cancer at the time, and they passed of leukemia. So she saw into that, and clearly that was the soul's path. But my guides have told me that in other cases, it's just a, a general time period. Yeah, because I'm very curious about this. We, we hear so much about healing and how we can heal ourselves uh, or to a degree uh, with our consciousness, with the way we eat. It's not just all about medicine and school medicine. We can do so much. But then some people end up dying nevertheless, even though they tried everything and did everything right, and others miraculously heal. So what is your perspective on that? that well, this is, this is amazing that you ask this. It's like a setup from spirit that you ask that question, because one of the special bonuses in this course I'm teaching with the Shift Network that's coming up in module six, I'm going to be playing a video of two days after Brenda passed, she asked me to channel her talking to a group of friends of ours. And I did. And we were all stunned because she just took over my gestures, the way I speak, my face changed a bit. And she talked to all of us. And I'm going to be sharing that in the class. I haven't made it public before. But in that video, which I just watched again after a few years of not seeing it, she explains that she had a healing with a really good healer and she died anyway. And she says, I was healed at an emotional level so that when I crossed, I'm immediately talking to you. So we think that healing means we don't die, but healing can happen on multiple levels. She was meant to cross when she did. 
She's helping more people now than she ever did when she was in human form. And she's so clear and her soul has evolved so much because the healing she had with a healer cleared out, as she said, the last of the emotional gunk from her childhood. Wow. I, I noticed how my body responded right now. That really resonated. And I thought that was so beautiful, such a beautiful uh, thing to know, because then it's not in vain. You know, all that work that we've done and the if somebody dies, it's, it's not in vain. And I, I'm thinking the more inner work we do over here, the more we're go going to benefit on the other side. And no doubt, no doubt. Yeah, and evolve further from there. So the more we can do here, the more we sort of can advance on the other side. Yeah. I had another woman that I connected with who was in a coma. Her friends wanted to know what her wishes were. Should they pull the plug? I didn't want to go there unless that woman could give me evidence that I was really talking to her soul. She gave me astounding evidence that I won't go into the whole list, but nobody had any doubt I was talking to her, even though she was in a coma. And I said, what are your wishes? And her answer, Janneke, was so obvious, yet so stunning because we missed this point. She said, they can pull the plug if they want. If it's my time, I'll go. If it's not, I'll stay. So we think we have to save everybody. Doctors go to great lengths to try to save people and then can't understand why they die anyway. There's a bigger picture that we miss when we stay in only human thinking. Yeah, I think that's where the surrendering part comes in, that there's so much we do not know. And there are a lot of things we can influence and co-create with. But there's always this mysticism that I think is penetrating everything and there are things we are not ought to know right now and that leads me over to the next question that i'm curious about because i i remember i interviewed dr Eben alexander about his near-death experience and he said something on the lines that that he got answers to everything and i'm curious about that is that your experience as well that when we die we sort of know it all <laughs> it is not it is not and it, i'm laughing because having just reviewed that channeling with brenda the people who were in that session with me were asking her questions in fact i asked her one and she laughed and she said that's a little above my pay grade that i didn't suddenly become this oracle that has all the answers so there are levels of veiling of all the wisdom that's available and not knowing often helps our evolution because we keep seeking in different ways. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, I think that both might be true as well, that it might be possible to have the experience that you get all the answers and then it might be possible not to have all the answers. Yes. Sort of everything is possible. What, what are the souls doing on the other side? Like my, uh, I have... Uh, a grandmother uh, and a grandfather uh, and my um, the mother of my father as well uh, have passed on and I'm very close to them still I talk with them even though I'm not yeah. hearing them that's okay they love that <laughs> yeah I hope so uh, and I'm so curious about what they're doing well you know being evidence-based I need to get information that is verifiable. And in fact, my most viewed video on YouTube is what our loved ones are doing in the afterlife. So it, you're not the only one who wants to know this, this answer. And they tell us that they're doing whatever they want to do, whatever they didn't get to do while they were here. And in many ways, serving those here and across the veil. And evolving just like we are here through full experiences so my favorite story it's on that videotape comes from this that's verifiable this woman who was my client asked me as we're talking with her husband in spirit what is he doing across the veil so i asked him and i said i know this sounds silly but he says i'm playing golf every day and i'm standing 
standing firmly on two feet. She just said, oh my God, I'm so happy to hear that because golf was his passion and he had one leg amputated before he passed and he was not able to golf. Wow. I got goosebumps. You see? Yeah. And it's so funny because for some reason, I imagine that the heaven or the other side or that dimension of frequency or whatever we want to call it is much more um, loose, not tangible, not concrete. I know. And it can be. And it can be. But it's it's loose and less concrete like a dream. Imagine you're dreaming lucidly. You're aware you're dreaming and you say, well, the stream's getting a little boring. I think I'll head over to Paris. And suddenly you're in Paris. They tell us that's what it's like. And yet it's very solid when they visit Paris, you know? Mm. So they, we obviously don't need bodies across the veil, yet that man created a body that can golf. Right. Because my experience from being out of the body, uh, which have been several years ago uh, when I sort of explored out of body experiences, I felt that I had a body uh, mm -hmm. and I studied what that meant. And I learned that it was an astral body and it felt That's very right. elongated and I could stretch my fingers and legs and I could fly. So I sort of imagine that we have sort of a body on the other side, but I guess maybe we can choose that or... Yes, and we choose how it looks. So they tell us that the average age people like to hang out as is 35 in perfect health and perfect size. <laughs> I have heard that because my mother had an experience. It was really beautiful. Uh, her, um, my grandfather passed away and all of a sudden she was uh, living alone. She was separated from my father and it was a very difficult time. And now they're together and it's a beautiful story, but it was a hard time. And she had this dream, and I think it's okay that I'm sharing it. Um, she had this dream where there was this, this monk walking uh, in front of her. And all of a sudden the monk turned around and she slowly started to wake up. And by the end of the bed, her father was standing in mm -hmm. like this white robe looking at as he was 30 years old and just looked yes. right into her eyes. And she was like stretching and like, dad, dad. And he was so concrete, but even though she could like uh, look through him, but yes. he was like standing there and then he evaporated yes. out of thin air. Yep. And she was like, what, why was he so young? She was so curious yes. about that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then on the opposite side of that, I had a young boy who I had brought through for his mother. He had died at about eight years old, dropped in on me a few months later. And he showed me his mom baking chocolate chip cookies. I reached out to her and I said, your son showed me this and he has a message for you that he will always be your little boy. Even if 20 years from now, you might think he's grown up and he might do that. But when you cross, he will appear to you as the boy you remember. And she started crying and said, Suzanne, I was making chocolate chip cookies earlier and thinking about him and thinking, will he grow up and grow a big beard? How will I recognize him when I pass? You see that little boy across the veil, her mom's thoughts knew how to get an answer through to her because I had already connected with him and he dropped in and shared that. Mm. Isn't that cool? Yeah. When we miss our loved ones and we don't have the skill that you do, uh, I, I assume that we can learn it uh, to some degree, uh, but I can find that sometimes I really miss my grandparents and I'm like, I wish you could give me a sign and then I don't see anything. And I'm like, why are you not showing me? Like I'm here, I'm asking. You always get uh, learn that you should ask, you know, ask and you shall receive and then nothing happens. Um, could you give some, some advice on how we can get in contact with our loved ones? Yes, this is the main thrust of my teaching is how to do that. First, we need to create space in our awareness so that we notice the signs. Most people have very busy minds and busy lives, and we're always very focused on this reality here, our human stuff. So even just a few 
minutes a day, I have a video called Sip of the Divine. Beautiful three minute practice that'll really transform the way you perceive things and how you get answers from across the veil. Three minutes a day just slows things down so that you can get answers. And then throughout the day, if your loved ones are trying to get your attention, you're going to be more likely to hear them and sense them. Many people have misperceptions about how our loved ones speak to us. I thought when my stepdaughter Susan passed that I would see her like your mother saw her father, or was it grandmother, at the end of the bed. And that is very rare. What a beautiful gift that was for her. But I saw my first spirit last week. It took me all these years of being a medium to see one run through the yard, somebody that I was about to bring through in a reading. It just doesn't work that way for most of us. So we notice how spirits snag our attention, grab our attention with a bird that's acting very unusual or a rainbow just when you're thinking about your loved one or the perfect song comes on the radio right when you were thinking of them. They're grabbing your consciousness and saying, yes, I'm here. Trust this sign. Hmm. It leaves me over to another thought. What about, you know, we hear about people who are lingering and not sort of transitioning to the other side. And I just interviewed this, um, this host of a program called uh, this House of Spirits, uh, where they investigate all kinds of paranormal uh, activities in houses where there are ghosts. W what are ghosts in your perspectives? Because that can be sort of so many things. Well, I don't have personal experience with it, but I did write the biography of my original mediumship mentor, Mavis Patilla. The book is called Droplets of God. And there are two beautiful stories in there where she really explains that ghosts are not scary. In most cases, there's those across the veil who hang around at this level to let us know there's something we need to pay attention to. So in the book, I share the story of a, a ghost, we'll call it a ghost, who was banging around in somebody's kitchen and they thought it was haunted and this is scary. So they were so scared. They brought Mavis in to check things out. She saw him there and she said, what are you doing? Why are you scaring these people? And he said, because their school age kids have brought home drugs and they're in that cabinet up there in the kitchen and they're going to get harmed if they use these drugs. And the parents climbed up on a ladder and up on the top shelf was, were the drugs. Wow. Once they reported it, that guy didn't need to hang out there anymore. He had kept the, the kids safe, job done. So yeah. it's not always scary. Right, because they have free will, um, yeah. I assume. And it would be allowed for them to hang around if they really are connected or, or feel like they're not done yet. And there's a message they need to get across. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. And of course, there are... there. There, there are going to be cases where somebody just doesn't want to leave. This was my house. I like it here. They don't realize they could have a whole other experience if they just uh, shift their focus just like we can. Yeah. What about people who don't want to live anymore and commit suicide? Um, I know some have been saying that that's a thing you mustn't do. Like that's... Um, that's sort of not judged in a way, but the transition will be very difficult. Um, and I know that there are many people in Scandinavia and many people all over the world, but uh, especially for some region in Scandinavia, there are a lot of suicides. And I'm curious, do you have some perspectives on sort of if their transition is different? There, I have enough? brought through so many souls who in their roles, the roles took their own life. And not a single one was judged for that. They were always met with understanding, but then they judged themselves. Number one, when they see the effect it had on those behind here. And number two, when they see that they came here to accomplish certain things and they didn't fulfill that. But again, they're not judged across the veil. And in most cases, they tell me that before they took on this lifetime here, their guide sat with them and said, this is going to be a really challenging life for you. You're going into a body that's going to have mental illness. You may get to the point where you can't handle it. We'd like you to hang in there. 
and the, the soul say, I'm going to give it a try. I really want to do this. This is going to be really good for my soul. And in some cases, they don't fulfill that. So they're ultimately, they almost all make a decision to come back at some point in what would be the future. There's no time across the veil and fulfill that lifetime. So yes, it's beautiful across the veil and there's no judgment. So why wouldn't we all want to go early? Because we really are here for the fullness of the experience, which includes the downs as well as the ups. And at the soul level, we knew that. So it's just a matter of hang in there. There, This too will, really will pass. And the contrast between the down and the up is what we came here to experience. Yeah. I, I Again, I got that uh, feeling in my body because it resonated so much that sometimes we can actually take on a lot as souls that we are very ambitious. I remember I've heard that before and that explains a bit to me why some people are going through so many difficult things and it's sort of I mean I, I uh, admire those souls for that like I'm going to do so much in this life and it almost gets too much and yeah. And it comes from our own will. And I, I think also it might be possible to ask, hey, can I soften my uh, plan here a little yes. bit? Yes, exactly. And my, my, my friend Lynette and I often say, you know, we, we see ourselves as souls jokingly sitting on a cloud eating popcorn as we watch ourselves here and say, what was I thinking? Yeah. You know, to come into life and do these things. And yet... When you learn we are souls and we can shift our perspective, it does put things in perspective and make it easier to tolerate. Yeah. And I think we also can reach out to angels. Like I really started to practice this and have fun with, with that because I Good. really moved. And there's been so much that hasn't worked in my old apartment my new apartment that there's just been so much to deal with and a few days ago I was like okay it's too much now I need help oh I'm going to ask angels for help and today things just sorted out themselves somehow hey. like the washing Good. machine started to work again uh, yeah all these practical things just worked out and I'm like why don't I ask angels for help more often that's right yeah. yeah, and I know that you've had a meeting with Archangel Michael. Yeah, and that's that's another big video. I, I didn't know everybody loves him as much as I do. <laughs> yeah, the, the video is Archangel Michael is real. He left, no doubt. That story takes a good 20 minutes to tell, so I won't go into it now. But there is zero doubt in my mind. And you told my story about my Navy commander background. I served as aide to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I mean, that's as high as it goes in the U.S. military. And I never believed in archangels. Not that you can't when you're in the military, but it wasn't part of my belief system. But he came through to me and has continued to do so in such profound ways with undeniable evidence that I know all of us have access to all of the archangels. And if we only remember that and do as you say, Yannick, and ask for help, it really does make a difference. Yeah. And what I'm curious about is, I mean, some people have been speaking about stories where they met a human and somehow that human just disappeared. And that's part of my story that's not even on the video. That's part two. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it is possible that angels can also be uh, is sort of uh, shift shaping. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, this man came to me for a reading and I was not tuning in well to loved ones. And I thought, what's going on here? I'm not connected. And all of a sudden, Archangel Michael dropped in on our reading. I was a little embarrassed because that's not really my focus to do that in a reading. And he, he, I said, you're getting advice to my client that says you should do this and that. And he said, who are you talking to? And I said, well, it's Archangel Michael. And my client said, ask him if we have ever met in human form. 
And I asked him and Archangel Michael said, yes. And my client continued to grill me. What was he wearing? What was he carrying? What did we talk about? 100% accuracy. I got it straight from Archangel Michael and it validated that he had dropped in on this man at one point and saved his life and then disappeared. Now, some people might say, well, you were just picking up on the memories of that man as he asked the question, but I already had validated what Michael feels like. I recognized who it was before the man even came in and the answers were coming from him. So this is anecdotal. It's no proof, but I don't need any more than that. Wow. That's so fascinating. You know, I would just love to meet an angel in like a human body. That would be so yeah. amazing. Maybe you already have. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> so uh, what would you say is the difference between an archangel and an angel? Yes, they have shown me first and foremost, they do not want to be put on a pedestal. They say, love is love. We are all expressions of one field of love. However, it's just a greater sphere of influence. So when you get to the astral realm where we go immediately after dying, Brenda can now visit all her friends at once. A lot more influence. The angels can influence whole groups of people. The archangels can influence all of humanity. You see? Huh. Yeah. Wow. Fascinating. Is it all love on the other side? Uh, is love what we're, what we are and love is what we will return to? Let me define love differently than we do in human form. To my understanding, love is lack of separation. Now for us in human form, when you fall in love with someone, you feel totally totally connected. That's a lack of separation. When you get rid of these bodies, there's no more body to make you think you're separate. You see that we are all spirit, light beings flowing in and out of each other. You understand there can be no separation, that we all arise from one mind. That's love, lack of separation. We feel it as total connection. So is it all love across the veil? Yes. Is it all love here? Yes, according to that definition. But with our human blinders on, we see the separation and we don't recognize what's going on here. But once you realize at the deeper level, we are all connected, how could we not love each other? So get rid of the body across the veil and it's totally different. I love that perspective. Thank you. Oh, thank you for this conversation. Uh, yeah. I, I really admire the work you're doing. And I know it couldn't be easy to go from one career that is totally different to what you're doing today. And the healing that comes along with that for so many people. Thank you so much for your beautiful work and for showing up today. Oh, thank you. I, I, I love that that the, the growth for all of us is ongoing. My guides talk to me every day. I get a message that, that tens of thousands of people read daily. It's called daily, The Daily Way. And then they constantly give me new teaching, mostly when I screw up. <laughs> they show me why that happened. And I share that monthly in webinars with people. And, and we just have a beautiful community of those who are on this path and finding more joy every day. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you, Yannicka. You are helping spread the ripples of love connection worldwide, and it's awesome. Thank you. It feels like a purpose. I can't do other things. It just feels really right. Yeah. And thank you for watching, everybody. Much light from the US and Norway. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.